Okay, for those of you who are uh, joining us, we're uh, live from Arc Gallery this evening. Uh, in, in just a few minutes, we'll start the artist talk with uh, Sylvia Pilotto, who is the featured artist in our Spotlight Gallery. Uh, we are featuring one artist every four months, three artists a year as a solo exhibition. Uh, and uh, Sylvia's solo exhibition at Arc will end uh, this Saturday. And then we're moving into the Spotlight Gallery. And most of the work here in the Spotlight Gallery um, is part of Sylvia Pilotto's Wabi Sabi series. Uh, she has a book that just came out. She'll tell you about that. Um, and if you look around the gallery, uh, you can see that there are uh, several works, uh, mostly about four by four. Uh, there's also some panels uh, that are very colorful from uh, Sylvia's Hard Candy series. And then over here to my left, uh, there's three panels uh, that are uh, part of the Wabi Sabi series. So uh, without further ado, um, we're gonna uh, leave the uh, Spotlight Gallery, and we're gonna start the artist talk. Sylvia will be speaking from her amazing live workspace uh, in the Bayview, and I'll be uh, uh, sitting here in the office, but I'll be uh, doing it on my iPad. So, Stephen, if you'd like to take over, I'm going to stop this video. So, Sylvia, if you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us about your history, um, how you came to art, and then talk about the, the Wabi Sabi series and the series that's on display and the um, Spotlight Gallery. Sylvia, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, thank you. Thank you for having me here. So I moved uh, to San Francisco a long time ago, over 20 years, and uh, I don't have an art background. Uh, I'm, um, I'm I'm trained as an engineer. It's hard to believe now. <laughs> and, but as soon as I arrived here, uh, I immediately felt inspired to work, to make art. And it's not something I saw that like I went to a gallery. I didn't have any, I didn't have much exposure to art or anything like that. And so it, it's kind of, it, it shocks me to this day how this happened. Uh, it's not like I went to a museum or I went to uh, a gallery and I saw a welded steel sculpture. Actually, I had never seen a, a welded steel sculpture and I just felt like I wanted to work with metal. So um, I took welding classes and I started making um, welded steel sculpture. And I did that for a while and uh, I started trying different um, medium I started painting. At first I did photography and then I, I did some painting, uh, but not much. Like slowly, you know, like I started trying with monoprint and I even got, I, I used to take a lot of classes at City College because that gave me the studio space for me to work. And um, I was urged by the professors there to go to the Art Institute to get a merit scholarship. I, I got a merit scholarship to go to the Art Institute and I started. But I, I was too sure of what I wanted to do and I felt like it was a waste of time. Maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't, but that's the way it felt. Um, and I never look back, I, you know, it's, I'm totally self-taught. So anyway, um, Eventually, I started, I was painting and making sculpture. And then at one point, I stopped with the sculpture. It's, it's like hard to do everything. And so the way I work, I have tried different media. And so I use acrylic, I use oils, I did collage, I use fiberglass. Sometimes I incorporate my photography into, with the painting. Um, so I I have tried every series that I work, when I start, when I get an idea, I, uh, I try to be very different from the previous series. Um, so let's say 
just before the Wabi Sabi since I'm going to be talking about the work that's at ARC, just before that I was doing um, abstract, colorful painting. And, um, and I had been doing that for a while. And, and then I moved into this space and I was working on the space. And I, 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 I believe that I was inspired by this, this space where suddenly I didn't want to see anything. I just wanted everything to be white. <laughs> and, um, and instead of using painting, I started using paper. So I went to scrap and I got a lot of posters there and um and but i used the back of it and um and so i got this collection of different shades of white and obviously the, the work doesn't start as completely white so i did a bunch of stuff on it and and even let's say gluing the the posters not with the white but with the the things that i want to cover and so I, I first like I make the mess and then I start gluing like the white and erasing everything. It's like almost um, seeing like how, how little I can get away with, you know? And, um, and it was interesting. I started pulling the paper and then when I didn't like something and that would make a mark depending of how I pulled the paper, it was never planned. But if I actually planned, it wouldn't work so well. And uh, and so it's like it it became like like as if it was a, a brush stroke, you know. And so like I started calling them painting with paper because they it's hard to believe like that they are only paper because they look like it looks like it's a painting, but it's not. So I did um, many pieces that were, they had a little bit of black. They had some, a bit of black and sometimes a tiny little bit of very muted yellow or something like that. And then I decided to bring a little bit of blue in a couple of them. So for a while, I didn't use any color whatsoever. So many, I mean, they might, like every, every single one didn't have any color. And then I decided to bring a little bit of blue. And that one, that one are looking at, it's not the first piece that I brought a little bit of blue. Um, and so I started trying with a tiny little bit. And, um, and then, you know, talking about the pieces that are at ARC. After a while of just bringing a tiny, tiny little bit of color, I decided that I wanted to try to bring a lot of blue. So instead, like I couldn't just go out and, and find, well, maybe I could, but I, you know, it's like I didn't want to be chasing around for the colors, the, of the shades of blue that I was thinking about. Out. So I decided to paint the paper. So I painted a bunch of, of those posters and I started incorporating more blue into it. And that's like the one that you guys are looking at. So it has more blue, right? And then I went crazy and I, I started doing like a whole blue wabi-sabi. And so there are three pieces is the th three next ones that you're going to see um, like there is a, a lot of a lot of blue and uh, and so this is all collage and uh, so I did I pretty much did the same thing that I was doing with the white paper but I was doing with the blue paper. And obviously there is some other colors there apart from blue, but it's uh, majority is blue. And I almost don't bring any paint uh, or ink or anything, but sometimes I do. And that's 
like right in there. It's the, that was done with, with paint, which I don't use much. Yeah, and so that's all like ripped paper and there is a, a white mark there that's paint. Uh, but in the in the wabi sabi in the ones that are mostly white, like you don't see much of that. You might see a tiny little bit of ink here and there, but it's pretty much all paper. And then um, and then there are three the three panels because like I have been doing this vertical shape. I started doing the vertical shape in two thousand and four. Those forty eight by eight. Uh, the panels that Michael calls them, how do you call them? Pillars. You call them, I'm the queen of the pillars. <laughs> so I did those three, those, those three pieces, they were actually at, um, at Julie Master Gallery and I eventually I got them back. The, uh, the, you could say that they're part of the, the Wabi Sabi, but it's pushing it because it's not as as minimal like the blue is not as minimal either but um so it's an extension of the wabi sabi and then uh the other pieces that are there are the like the panels i was talking about that i started making in 2004 i still make them here and there i'm making them less and less now but um it has been fun making those panels so basically um, the, the vertical shape is built and it's always, not always, I have done like really tall ones and very skinny. So I, I have um, done different sizes, but this is the classic Peloto panel, it's 48 by eight. And, uh, and so what it is, it's like, it's a, it's a wood panel that's, I normally work on wood because I do a lot of sanding. I abuse the panels and, um, and so it's much better for me than canvas. And I also uh, was like putting resin in these panels. And, and canvas is too floppy for that. So like I work on wood. And so it's basically paint, uh, a lot of collage, some drawing. And uh, it occurred to me when I started making the panels that, you know, like when I made the first couple like many years ago because it had so many elements so many different media it almost felt that it needed something to bring everything together and uh, and that was the resin uh, that's when I, I put the resin like it the color really popped and uh, and it became one thing like this object instead I could have put glass but it wouldn't have been the same. And, uh, and the, actually talking about the resin, there was a point when I started doing the Wabi Sabi that it crossed my mind putting resin, but that's obviously it was the wrong thing because one thing that I really appreciate about this, the Wabi Sabi piece is is and that's where the name came from it's like all these imperfections because like all the pulling and the banging and the, you know it's like it, there's there are a lot of nooks and little things that um it's what makes the piece interesting and uh and if i put resin on that i first of all if i had them if i had put resin on it I would have sent it to take the shine away because I didn't think the shine would go there. But I, I, des I decided not to because it would all the little things that make it what it is, it would be gone. They would be very slick, but um, and they would be beautiful, but it would have lost its soul, I think. So um, I considered the resin for five minutes. And then um, I changed my mind. Jeff and I, we are together. We used to talk about my work quite a bit. So he said, you know, let's make, um, let, uh, let's start having these interviews. Let's work on a book. 
So we actually started uh, doing the book for another series that's not out in the world yet. So we started doing that and it was extremely interesting. Be like in the beginning, so he would ask me these questions and I would get really annoyed at him. I was like, what kind of question is that? And then I would always come up with the answer and, and it made me think and it, it was it's like, it was amazing. So we didn't finish the, the first book that we started because then he's like, you know what? Let's do a book for the Wabi Sabi. And I'm like, okay, so the, we interrupted the first uh, one to do the, the, to inter, to do the Wabi Sabi. And the, the name of this book, uh, that you couldn't remember, it's called Beauties of Nothingness, is the Wabi Sabi series. And uh, it, it's very, very informal, those interviews, the, the interview is, uh, and it's very candid. It's not pretentious at all. It's like a conversation, we're having this conversation on the couch, that's what it is. It's a soft cover and what I, what I, we wanted to have actually a copy so I could show you, but we couldn't do it fast enough because it was, um, the book itself, putting the whole thing together, it was fun, but all the details about like the publishing, it was a pain. So it took longer than we wanted and Jeff is super busy with his work and stuff. But I, so I'm just warning you that you are welcome to go immediately and purchase if you're interested, but we have not seen the book yet. So it might be flawed. <laughs> it's, no, seriously. But because that's part of Wabi Sabi, isn't it? <laughs> it's true. It's true. And it probably would be awesome because it wouldn't, uh, the first ones that are flawed, maybe it would be more interesting that after when we fixed whatever, or maybe it's just fine as it is. Yeah. But we, we, don't, we saw the PDF, but we have not seen in our hands. So I ordered one copy today. <laughs> and so it's going to come in a few days. So I have not so seen it. So more to come. I've, yeah, but sorry. I'm not quite sure how long I've known you for. Uh, it's a pretty long time. Yes. Um, yes. Maybe 20 years. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe a little longer. I'm not quite sure. But uh, Sylvia had a fabulous uh, live workspace in the mission uh, when I, uh, uh, and that's where I first first met her. And then um, uh, I'm not quite sure when it was that you uh, started the whole acquisition of where you are right now. 2012. 2012. So in 2012, uh, she announced to me that she was going to uh, stay in her live workspace in the mission, but she was going to build out this uh, uh, old abandoned uh, bank. I was confused. Church. I was confused. <laughs> and uh, uh, and and, and uh, as is generally the case, I think with artists in general, and certainly with Sylvia, is um, you start off in one direction, but that's not the direction that you end up going in. Um, and so eventually, she abandoned the live workspace and the mission, and completely transformed this. And I was there. This, I mean, this was an incredibly rundown, uh, dusty, horrible building in in the Bayview, and now it is the most magnificent uh, live workspace in San Francisco. Um, so, Michael, and, just a second, just a second. Um, it the, okay. So, Michael saw from the very beginning when I when I purchased this building, I panicked. I'm like, what have I done? And, uh, and for two days, I had different ideas. So it's not like eventually, it, it just lasted two or three days, my agony, but you were there to see my agony. <laughs> I was there at the very beginning and then it morphed into something incredibly uh, special. And I, I would point out that uh, you can contact Sylvia. Uh, if you look behind her, you're really not getting a full sense of the space, but I'm sure she'll give you a, a little tour with her uh, uh, computer camera in just a second. But um, all of the work, or not all of the work, but almost all of the work that's on the wall and on the shelves is actually her work. And it's, uh, it's so it's, it, in addition to being where she lives, 
it's also a, a showcase for, for her work in general. And uh, I know that there's a, a number of people that I'm seeing on the screen right now, because I'm looking at the gallery view, who have been to her space and can attest uh, to just how incredibly uh, special that space is. And this space, um, so you said it's live work. Yeah, I work, but not everything is done here. I have the studio, the shipyard. But yeah. if someone wants to see my work, I don't bring them at the shipyard unless I'm having an open studio. I bring them here because I do the work, everything at the shipyard and a normal day is in progress. And when something is, is ready, then I bring it here and I either hang it on the wall and it doesn't stay too long. So things rotate because I either send it to galleries or I sell it or whatever. So they, they kind of rotate in this space. And, uh, and sometimes I choose to do some work here, but the studio for the huge mess, it's at the shipyard. So Sylvia, so why don't you uh, give people a little bit of a tour and while you're doing that, if any of you have any questions and you'd like to tap, so, uh, type know, them into chat. I don't know if that's, I, it's what I'm seeing on the screen. I can, I don't know. Well, it, it's a pretty good sense of it, Sylvia. Yeah, and okay. if you have questions, if you type into your chat uh, on Zoom, then uh, uh, we can uh, do the... Uh, yeah, so I think the best, questions. this is like some color ones. I'm going to show some wabi-sabis here. So the best thing is to contact me and come over for a studio visit. We, we, can, we, we wear a mask and stay six feet apart. Can you, can you see it? Yes. It's, so it's, this is uh, some of some of the wabi-sabi here behind me and just a peek really quick of like some of my other work that i'm not showing yet <laughs> so that's enough that's enough <laughs> it's just like if you if you want to see the work i have i have more work upstairs and more work downstairs and so you can email me or call me or text me and we can make an appointment and um, i have had actually people coming during covid times like with masks and so it's totally possible it's a big space so you know it's very possible to be in that space yes it's, it's pretty, easy to uh, stay six be, feet away be apart you know okay. and, and, uh, in better times, and there will be better times again someday, uh, but in better times, we've done uh, some amazing wine and cheese uh, yes. things at Sylvia's uh, space, and, uh, and that too will happen again, but uh, not, not just yet. Sorry, questions. Any questions again? Is there, Steven? You, Steven, do you see any questions yet? So, Sylvia, could you explain the concept of Wabi Sabi for us? Wabi-sabi, like by now I see wabi-sabi everywhere. When I started making them, um, I had never heard of it. I came across a book about wabi-sabi and that actually inspired me to call like his Japanese philosophy of like the things that are broken or used or cracked and seeing the beauty in the imperfection. Uh, and I see that in this work and that's where the name came from okay. and why did you choose the color blue for this new series i don't even know why like i think you know this is how it, it happened um i think i had a, i started with a little bit it was some blue paper was sitting in my studio so i used because it was just there and then it grew from there. I think I had a can of a blue paint and I painted some blue. I'm like, okay, I need more shades of the blue or, you know, like, and so that's how it went. It doesn't have a specific meaning okay. to why it became blue. And it seems that a lot of your pieces are large scale. So do you ever work in small scale or? Oh uh, yeah, I have more? like, I totally like, I even made some three by threes. <laughs> so, I have some of those. Yes, you do, yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, but I, I enjoy working uh, in a large format. And you know one thing about the wabi-sabi? For some strange reason, 
they're, I feel like they're more success, successful when they're really large. For some, like, I don't know why. I didn't make, I, I think I tried, but I was not happy with this small. Maybe I try again, but I think they work really well um, in the large format. So we also have a question. How does your engineering background inform what you create? So you told us you started as an engineer. Does it uh, influence what you make and how you make it? It must influence me, but I don't see it. I like, I, I like, I don't. Um, I have heard people say that to me, uh, that they see that I'm an engineer, especially when uh, I was doing welded steel sculpture. So uh, there was, uh, for a while, like I was the instructor's assistant. So like I would help the students weld and all of that. And, and, and they would come to me and they would say, um, they wanted to know if whatever they were trying to put together and if it was going to stand up. And then um, I would, Look at and, and I'm like, you must know it's easy for you because you're an engineer. I'm like, this has nothing to do with engineering degree. It has to do with common sense. <laughs> so it's like, to me, it was obvious if that was going to stand up or not. It, it's not because I was an engineer. So they thought that my sculptures, they looked at them and they see, I really don't see it. But I, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. You know, and it must be somehow uh, have a part in me, but I like I'm not aware of it. I think like the the way I see it, the only way that the engineering helped me, maybe um, it's it was with time timing because like I I would have never considered going to art school when I was young, but if I, I feel like maybe if I had gone to art school, who knows, maybe I was too young and I wouldn't follow through, who knows? I want to believe that. <laughs> well, I think that there is a certain level of problem solving that you do, Sylvia, you know, relative uh, uh, where your engineering background, I think, informs how you problem solve. The, the fiberglass works that you did uh, was a whole new sort of process and that uh, and you know going down that road on that new process was certainly to some extent an engineering problem uh, and you know some of the other uh, techniques that you've done um, have definitely felt to me as if you approached them almost like engineering problems yeah so me yeah I'm open to that it could be <laughs> Okay, and DeWitt wanted to ask if you um, were, want, were trying to reference landscape in any of your series. So with the blue for the sky, the brown and ochre for, for land, um, is that something that you've had in mind in making these pieces? Um, not beforehand, afterwards, like I maybe that crossed my mind, but like not, I didn't specifically went after that. So your work is more about the process and then more intuitive than planning out uh, what you want to say or- explain. Yeah, well, you know, it depends. Like it, depending on the series, it's, um, I do some kind of thinking and uh, I have an intention of like how, what I'm going to say, but some other work is, is, is like, it, it's, it doesn't work that way. Like, I, I don't know what's going to come out. I just, it's, about, it's more about the process. Mm -hmm. But either way, like, I leave for the rush of like, having an abstract idea and, and, and turning that into a tangible thing. Like, that's what keeps me, you know? Okay, we have another person who has a question about what medium you're using to adhere the paper to the... Ah, okay. So I use um, gel medium. And uh, I think for me, is um, it has worked really well. And all of the, if like, if you're interested in any of that, 
in the interview in the book oh my god when, when Jeff was asking me questions that I didn't see any mystery or I didn't think those questions to be interesting like things about the process it kind of it made into the book because it it might not be for me but it once it was written it kind of like actually it, it became interesting so i talk about all of that like how how the whole wabi sabi happened so i grew and and at what point i can't i i can't see a bubble because at one point it's fine because i rip it and that becomes a a mark that i was not planning but it, it, a, a mark that came out really well but um but you know it's like uh, okay at that at, at, at up to this point everything has to be super flat but then after this a certain point then I, it's totally fine if there is a bubble maybe I, i'm not not that i'm planning the bubble but if there is a bubble not a problem i rip it and of course not in every case that i rip it it's going to be cool but in a lot of cases it is or if it's not cool at that moment, it turns into something else and that becomes part of the process. So anyway, I know the question was about the gel medium, but, and I went on, <laughs> but yeah, gel medium. Gel medium, and it's very important to have a little tool, like to really push the, the paper and to get the gel medium out. And then I get that gel medium, and I, I don't know, I, I'm not aware where I'm putting that gel medium. And at the end of the day, I'm like all around these blobs of glue. It's crazy. Like the legs of the chair where I sit when I'm doing it. And the funny thing, I don't see me doing that. And I just like, I keep doing that. And even my clothes and, and it's full of glue. And that's also made into the book. <laughs> they became the relics. So Jeff wanted to photograph the legs of the chair and my jacket and the pants or the walls. And that made into the book, you know, about the Wabi Sabi. So it's kind of fun. <laughs> I would never think that that would be uh, worthy of be talked about, but I guess I needed someone else's so when, when the piece is complete, there is a lot of sanding involved as well. But when the piece is done, I do put gel medium once again, and then when it's dry, I I do a, a varnish and matte because I don't want or or yeah matte, not even uh, satin. I, I I like the matte for the, the wabi sabi. Um, but yes, it's gel medium everywhere. Okay, so that's all the questions that we have. Michael, do you want to wrap things up? Uh, I did want to ask one question, too. Uh, do you ever end up uh, discarding works that uh, uh, don't turn out the way you wanted them to? Or do you uh, repurpose those works? Um, uh, you no, know, what I, is your process? Yeah, my, my work, I work in this wood panels, and the, of course it has happened that... I have painted over things or, you know, so I don't really throw the, the pens away. I always use it for something else. There was just one occasion when I made uh, these blocks of resin and objects. I threw these objects inside of these boxes uh, with the only purpose that I made this, it was to get a photograph and, and once, once I was uh, done with that, I, I threw them away, but I knew I was going to throw them away. Um, yeah. And so. Priscilla had one question too, which is more business related, which is, uh, do you, uh, how much of your time do you spend, and, and do you have like a formal demarcation, how much time do you spend on the business side of your art, and how much time do you spend on the maker side of your art? Yeah, unfortunately, it's like 
the business take a lot of time. Not that I'm, um, I'm not, I feel like I'm not on the top of it the way I should be. Um, I hope that changes soon. <laughs> Instagram and all of that, so I, I have not had that down yet. Um, but that takes a lot, even like the bookkeeping and things like that. It's very annoying, but that's... Uh, you can't be a successful artist if you don't pay attention to those <laughs> things, though. Um, and uh, uh, just by way of thank you so much uh, for showing us uh, around, Sylvia. Uh, and uh, thank everybody. Thank you all. Yeah, thank for, you so uh, much showing for showing up for this. Thank you very much.